This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course on schemes and will be about how to tell whether a morphism x to y of schemes is separated um, using valuation rings. Um, so we'll first start by looking at the um, case of Hausdorff spaces. So a space is Hausdorff means informally that sequences have at most one limit point. Well, that's not precisely what it means, but in, in practice it's kind of similar. So you can think of it as following. Suppose we've got a space X and suppose we've got a map from the open unit interval 0, 1 to x. Um, we can ask, how can this be extended to a map from the closed unit interval to x? And if x is Hausdorff, there is at most one way of doing this. So there's at most one extension if x is Hausdorff. Um, on the other hand, if x isn't Hausdorff, there may be more than one extension. For example, we may take x to be a line with two origins. And then if we've got an open interval 0 to 1, we might map it to here in the obvious way. And if we extend it to a closed interval by adding a point here, then this point can go to either there or there. So there are two possible extensions. Um, well, it's also useful to have a sort of relative case of this. So suppose we've got a map of spaces from X to Y. Then we can ask, suppose we've got um, an open interval mapping to X and we want to extend it to a map from the closed interval to x. Well, we suppose we're given um, a mapping from this to y. We've got an obvious inclusion homomorphism there. Then we can ask, um, is there more than one way to extend this? So we can ask how many extensions? Of this map are there? Um, so, um, if there's only one extension, we might think of X as being kind of relatively Hausdorff over Y. For example, we might take X to be a plane with two Y axes. Um, so X is going to be a plane and you kind of duplicate the Y axis by gluing two copies of the plane together. And we might map this to a line with two origins. Um, and now, if you've got an open interval mapping to x, say it maps it to this, and we're given an extension of this um, to the, the half open interval to y, well, the green point can go to either here or here. So there are, there are two ways to extend this to y. y isn't separable. However, if we choose one of these extensions, there's only one way to lift it to, um, to, to, to a map here. So there's only one way to lift this. So there's only one lift. Well, I guess in general, there's at most one lift. So let's say at most one lift. So although X and Y are both non-Hausdorff, in some sense, this map from X to Y is, is relatively Hausdorff. All the, all the non-Hausdorffness of X comes from the fact that Y is non-Hausdorff in some sense. Um, and what we want to have is an analog of this in algebraic geometry. So, so this property here will turn out to um, correspondent algebraic geometry to the property that morphism x to y is separated. 
Um, and as we see, X and Y can be non-separated, but this morphism might be separated. Um, so we need the analog of the open interval contained in the closed interval. So in analysis, this will be the open interval naught to one, and this will be the point one. And the analog of this is the spectrum of R, where R is a discrete valuation ring. So you know the spectrum of R has two points. It has a generic point and it has a closed point. So this is the, the generic point given by the ideal zero. And this is the closed point given by the ideal P, where P has valuation one. If you would like an explicit example, we could take R to be, say, the ring of formal power series over the reals. Uh, the quotient field K is then the ring of Laurent series. And um, the spectrum of R, well, well the, the, the elements of this ring are a sort of functions on the real axis given by power series, except they're not quite because the power series is only formal and doesn't converge everywhere. But you can think of it as being converging in an infinitesimally small part of the real line. So it converges at zero and it doesn't really converge anywhere else at zero, but we sort of pretend that if you're infinitely close to point zero, then this power series converges. So its spectrum can be thought of informally as looking something like this. And if you look at these two pictures and sort of squint at them and don't look too closely, they look very similar. Um, of course, they're not similar at all because this is two points and is non-Hausdorff and this space is Hausdorff and has an uncountable number of points. But if you don't worry about that too much, these two things are very, very similar. Um, so if we go back to this diagram, here we, here we had um, um, a diagram we had earlier where we were trying to have um, a map from... We had a map from X to Y, and we had maps here, and we were trying to ask if you can extend this in um, um, at most one way. Now, now let's translate this into the language of schemes. What we do is we take schemes X and Y, and well, what we what we have down here is the spectrum of a discrete valuation ring R, and here we have the spectrum of K, where K is the um, field of quotients of R. And we ask, um, if we're given these four maps, we can ask how many lifts are there. And we might expect that there's at most one lift should be somehow related to the property that X to y is separable. So we can ask, is this related to x to y being separable? Um, and the answer is sometimes. So there's a theorem by Groth and it which says that if x is a finite type over y, that means the morphism from x to y is a finite type, and y is notarian, Then, then the two properties here, um, that there's always at most one lift and x, y are separable. So these two properties are equivalent. Okay, this is slightly different from the version in Hartshorn's textbook. Hartshorn has slightly less restrictive conditions on x and y and it's also a bit different because Hartshorn doesn't just require R to be a valuation discrete valuation ring, but he uses the case when R is allowed to be any valuation ring. Um, um, so the version 
here comes from, if you want to look it up, it comes from Growth Index Elements of Algebraic Geometry, Chapter 2, Part 7.2 or whatever. And which version you use is really a kind of matter of preference. Um, if you don't like this, if you don't like general valuation rings as Growth Index didn't, then you put on slightly stronger conditions on X and Y so you can get away with just using discrete valuation rings. Um, this is also actually one of the other problems in scheme theory. Every theorem not only has a large number of small conditions uh, you need to make it work, but there are always half a dozen versions of every theorem with slightly different variations in which conditions you have and slight variations in how strong the theorem is. So it's a real headache trying to remember all these. Um, so I'm not going to prove either version of this theorem. Um, there's a perfectly good proof written out in Hartshorn's book. Uh, instead, I'm going to give some examples of how to use it. So the first problem is, before using this, is what is a morphism from spectrum of K or the spectrum of R to a scheme X? Um, so, well, first of all, morphism from the spectrum of a field K to X are easy to describe. So here K is a field. Well, first of all, the spectrum of K has just one point. So its image in the, in the spectrum of X is going to be a point. So we need to choose a point in X. And let's call this point P. And this point will have a local ring, let's call it XP. So XP equals local ring of um, X at P, which is sort of informally, it's, you can think of it as being something like functions on X that are defined near P. And in order uh, for this to be a homomorphism of schemes, we need to give a homomorphism of rings from X to the local ring or spec K at this, which is just K. And this must be a local homomorphism. And you remember the local homomorphism means the inverse image of the maximal ideal of K must be the maximal ideal of this ring here. So if we, if we let K of P be the um, X of P modulo its maximal ideal, you can think of K of P as being the, the uh, sort of field associated with the point P. Then we have a homomorphism from K of P to K. So a, homo, um, a, a morphism of schemes from spectrum of K to X is equivalent to choosing a point of X plus a homomorphism of fields from uh, the local, so not the local ring, not the, the, the field at P to the field K. So, so morphisms from spec K to schemes are easy to control. Um, now we need to know what is a homomorphism from um, the spectrum of R to X, where R is a discrete valuation ring. Well, the spectrum of R has two points, and we can call these points X0, and let's call the generic point X1. And there's a, we've got a homomorphism to, sorry, from, from the spectrum, no, so homomorphism from the spectrum of K to this ring. It's always difficult remembering which way around these wretched arrows go. So um, we need to choose two points, X0 and X1 and X, which are the images of these. And in order for this to be a continuous map, we must have X0 is contained in the closure of X1. And we notice that if x0 is in some open affine, then x1 is in the open affine. 
set. So this makes it particularly easy to work out homomorphisms from the spectrum of R to X, because if X is covered by open affines, then this is just given by homomorphisms to one of these open affines. We don't have this problem that the image of the spectrum might be in several different open affines, which makes it rather trickier to work out homomorphisms. Um, and um, we get um, a homomorphism of the spectrum of fields as before. So we get a map from K of X1 to um, K, where K, little K of X1 is the field of this point here. And we also need a map from the local ring of X at X naught to R. And this must be a homomorphism of local rings. Um, so it must be a local homomorphism of local of, of local rings. So, so the inverse image of the maximal ideal of here must be the maximal ideal of here. Well, since R is a subring of K, we may as well um, quotient out X, the, the, the local ring here, by um, um, the inverse image of zero in K. So um, we can um, take the image of, of this local ring in KX1, and what we get is, is, a, is a homomorphism of the image of X, X naught in KX1 to R. Um, so this allows you to describe homomorphisms from the spectrum of a discrete valuation ring to any scheme. So let's work out two examples. So the first example, let's check the line with two origins is not separated using this um, using this method using valuation rings. So the picture we get here is, let, let, let's take um, the discrete valuation ring to be um, just the localization of polynomials at the point zero. So this is all quotients of polynomials such that the denominator is non-zero at the origin. And our diagram that we've got to investigate looks like this. So here we've got the bug-eyed line or line with two origins. And we're, we're given maps like this, and we want to investigate how many ways there are of lifting this. Um, so let's translate this into um, homomorphisms of rings. So um, here we've got Kx, and here we've got the localization as a subring of it. And here we've just got the morphism from K to there. And here we've got um, two copies of KX kind of glued together. So we've got two different maps like that. Um, and um, uh, we, we, we're going to take the homomorphism here that's just the that, that's just the obvious inclusion of k of x the, the the ring of polynomials to the field of rational functions so so we just take these to be the obvious inclusions um now uh, we want to work out uh, sorry i've got this arrow the wrong way around again the problem is whenever you switch from schemes to rings you always have to change the direction of the arrows and so it's incredibly easy to get them the wrong way around. Um, so uh, now, now if we fix one of these um, uh, rings K of X, there's obviously exactly one way of extending this map because we, it, it, the only way is obviously the natural embedding of this ring into here. Um, however, there are uh, two possibilities because we can map the closed point here to either one of these two points here. 
So this corresponds to either mapping this ring to here or this ring to here. And these give us two different um, homomorphisms from this scheme to this scheme here. Informally, um, if you think of a spectrum of this as being a um, open set followed by a point, then the two maps, the, 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 the open point always goes to the generic point here, but there are two possibilities for where the green point it can go to. It can go to either of these. But once you've chosen the image of this green point, then there's the, 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 then the rest of the morphism of the schemes is uniquely determined. So there are exactly two morphisms here. Anyway, <clears throat> there's more than one morphism. So this map here is not separated. Um, so the second example, let's show that the projective line mapping to, let's work over the integers. Let's do the spec projective line over the integers. We want to show that this is separated. Um, <clears throat> so the projective line and the line with two origins, so P1 and the line with two origins are both obtained by gluing two copies of A1 along A1 minus the origin in some sense. So, so these two ways differ in that one of them is not separated and the other one is separated. So being separated is a fairly subtle property of exactly how you glue things together. Um, so first of all, we need to recall what are the points of P1 of Z with values in a local ring R. So we're only going to use a discrete valuation ring, but we may as well do it for all local rings. Well, we've got a map, we need a map from the spectrum of R to P1 over z. Now p1 over z consists of two copies of the affine line over z, which have been glued together. And spectrum of z has a, um, so the spectrum of r has a closed point, and um, then it's got various other points that we don't know very much about. Uh, but the point is, that if the, um, the, 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 if the image of the closed point is in some open affine, then the image of the spectrum of R is in the same open affine. So this makes it particularly easy to find maps from the spectrum of R to P1 of Z because the image is going to lie in one of these open sets. We don't have to worry about it maybe being partly outside the first one and partly outside the second. Um, so, um, well, it, morphisms from the from the spectrum of any ring to the affine line over Z are very easy. They're, they're, they're just, the affine line over Z is just spectrum of Z of X and morphisms from Z of X to a ring just correspond to elements of the ring. So morphisms from spectrum of R to the affine line just correspond to elements of R. So um, morphisms to the first um, copy of the affine line correspond to elements, say, R naught of R. And morphisms to the second copy of the affine line correspond to some element R1 in R. And we have to glue these together 
that some morphisms um, to the first A1 will correspond to certain morphisms of the second. And the, the, the way they're glued together is that R0 is the same, so R0 is the same as R1 if R0 times R1 is equal to 1, because we're, we're gluing these two copies of the affine line by sort of changing something to its inverse. Um, so, um, so the points can be identified as pairs x0, x1, um, such that x0 or x1 is a unit, and x0, x1 is the same as lambda x0, lambda x1, if lambda is a unit. And here, the point R0 that we've got there might just correspond to the point R0 colon 1, and R1 might just correspond to 1 colon R1. And you can see that this, this, um, um, this description here is the same as this description here. So points of the projective line just are roughly what you would expect. Um, so now let's check the lifting property. So you remember we've got this map spectrum of K goes to P1 over Z goes to spectrum of R goes to spectrum of Z. And we're checking maps that go in, I think it's this direction. Um, and now let's check this in terms of rings. No, sorry, no, we don't need to do it in terms of rings. So maps here, so these sorts of maps just consist of pairs K0, K1 with not both zero. And of course, um, K0, K1 is equivalent to lambda K0, lambda K1. And points here correspond to pairs R0 colon R1 with um, R0 or R1 a unit. And again, this is equivalent to lambda R0 lambda r naught, lambda r one. So the question is, if we're given a point k naught k one like this, is there at most one point r naught r one like this? And given k naught k one, there is exactly one r naught r one up to equivalence um, that corresponding to it, which obviously is K naught R1 equals K1 R naught. And this is obvious if K naught is uh, not zero, then um, we can just take the point one K1 over K naught. And if K naught is zero, we just take the point naught colon one and you can check that the, um, if R0 and R1, if, if you take R0 and R1, one of them is a unit, say R0 is a unit, you may as well divide by R0. So you can assume R0 is one, and then um, there's only one point correspond, that, that, then that point is unique given the ratio between R1 and R0. So the projective line over um, the integers satisfies the condition for being separable given by valuation rings. Um, in fact, you can easily extend this to n-dimensional projective space over, over the integers or for that matter, any field. Um, okay, next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, proper maps in general topology and algebraic topology.